All right, well, thank you uh, once again for uh, uh, joining us for this uh, weekly media briefing. Uh, as you can see, we've come down into an area that you were in a few weeks ago and that the, the amount of activity is uh, is quite considerable. And Roger will talk more about that in a minute. So let's first make a couple of comments um, to do with temporary accommodation. Uh, the temporary accommodation service was set up uh, from the 7th of February uh, because we knew that we were coming up to a time when people may have exhausted their insurance component to assist with their accommodation. Uh, uh, as it turns out, um, there were very few who ran out of insurance uh, accommodation money in March, um, but there were a larger number uh, we expected uh, and do expect from September of 4 this year as the uh, anniversary of the, the September 4 event uh, comes up. So the temporary accommodation assistance is available at a rate of $180 a week for a single person household, $275 a week for a household of two people and $330 a week uh, for three or more people. That's not means tested, it's not asset tested, it's for people who have a mortgage uh, or other response, uh, other outgoings, um, uh, but essentially a mortgage, uh, but have, who have exhausted the insurance component uh, of accommodation assistance. Um, and so far we've had 110 applications since the 7th of February and there are currently 93 people who are, or households who are drawing on that. And there's been a question raised about uh, people in the red zone and what it means for them. Uh, what I can assure people is that it's the government's intention uh, that those people in the red zone who are subject to the government offer uh, will be able to access that uh, accommodation assistance for as long as they have those mortgage obligations. Uh, and uh, in order to make that happen, the Ministry of Social Development are putting a, a paper to a Cabinet Committee uh, in the week coming uh, and the uh, approval for that will be well and truly sorted out ahead of the first uh, anniversary date of the September 4 event. There's been a lot of talk about winter heating uh, and a suggestion that the programme was being curtailed. Um, I think uh, that has been overstated. Uh, and somewhat unfairly represented. First point I'd make is that um, uh, uh, Fletcher's have indicated uh, that the program uh, will start to slow down. Now that's perfectly reasonable and to be expected. In the initial stages the assessment was that we would need to put in some four and a half thousand winter heating units. Up until the uh, 27th of, uh, of July there had been over 9,000 winter heating units put in place um, and so the program has met more than twice what was expected and for people that uh, need to have emergency heating put in place the program continues but uh, you would expect that when you've already hit double what was expected there would be a point where the program would start to slow down so it's not finished, it's not over, it's not cancelled but it is likely to slow down. Uh, I think. Um, Suggestions that the most recent 700 approvals uh, were simply tidy ups or lapses in paperwork, uh, that suggestion has come from an installation company. It's completely wrong and we totally refute that uh, and uh, those sorts of comments are not uh, particularly useful uh, when they can't be substantiated. So to be clear, we expected to do 4,500 odd uh, winter heating installations, uh, in fact on an urgent basis. Um, there will be still of course many that over a period of time uh, as part of their normal repairs will have heating installations replaced but the urgent uh, winter heating was expected to be four and a half thousand the actual number the 27th of June uh, July was 9,493 6,924 of those are heat pumps uh, 2,569 are solid fuel burners and there are more still on order um, and again I would state that if people know of uh, people who are in an urgent situation uh, then they should uh, make that known to uh, the Fletcher EQR office. I think it's fair to say that given the uh, response has been double what was expected uh, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, way in which the Governor has risen to, on the occasion to meet those needs has been quite, quite good. I want to talk about Orange Zone process, uh, progress. Uh, is there anyone here from the press? We just make sure that you can hear what I'm saying. Yes. Um, as signalled at last week's press conference, we've written this week to Kaiapoi residents to tell them 
that we intend to announce the decision on their land uh, as to whether it is orange, uh, uh, sorry, green or red uh, in the next three to four weeks. That's a repeat of what was said at last week's press conference. I undertook to send those people a letter um, uh, when we first wrote to them some weeks ago and on the 29th of July uh, those letters were sent out. Preparation of those letters was well ahead of any speculation in the Christchurch press this week. I've also written, or I'm sorry, Roger Sutton uh, on behalf of Sarah has written uh, to all other Orange Zone residents outside of Kaiapui, uh, giving them a clearer indication of how long the process is going to take. It's not a simple job to determine whether or not someone should uh, accept an offer to move off a piece of property. It's a big decision uh, for the government to make in the first place. It's a bigger decision for individuals to make about what they choose to do with those offers. And I realise that it's frustrating and it's difficult for residents, uh, but I, I, I know very personally how frustrating it can be and the sort of turmoil uh, that the front page of this week's paper can create for people. Uh, so we're making it very clear and always intended to make it clear what that timeline was likely to be. Um, it's my hope and certainly the hope of the Chief Executive uh, that uh, the timeline that we've indicated can be shortened uh, but it is put out there on a, on a reasonable basis so people can get their expectations into the right place. Um, we'll write to residents and all these again, again in the weeks ahead as decisions are made so that they can have that information as close as possible to any uh, public announcements. Can I just say, I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the interest now in Christchurch as a destination for future investment is starting to ramp up and that's very, very encouraging for us. We haven't seen, as you see in other countries, uh, the sort of deep population that was initially expected. Uh, that means that a lot of Cantabrians, a lot of people in the Greater Christchurch area continuing to make a commitment uh, to, to building their lives here, that's fantastic and we want to continue supporting them uh, in that as well as we can. Roger. I was going to talk about a couple of things. The first thing was we've got an expo this weekend on Saturday and Sunday at the CBS Arena to try and put in one place um, information for people who think they are going to be moving um, about house packages, about land packages. Um, insurance, um, banks, so we've tried um, gathering together as many organisations in one place as we can to go to a one-stop shop to get information, so that's at the CBS Arena this weekend. We've got something like 70 different organisations who are going to be exhibiting. Um, they're also going to be operating under rules so they can't make people sign up contracts while they're there because the Minister said it's really important that people do actually take time around these sorts of decisions. They do actually consider them but we're just trying to put everything in one place so they can start thinking about the issues and work out what they're going to do. Um, the other thing that's been happening is people have been um, returning to us their um, consent forms. We've been trying to um, work with um, individual householders so that we have their consent so we can start talking to their insurance companies to get all their details. So when we send them their offer, or we start being able to present them an offer in two or three weeks' time, we've actually got all their insurance information so we can do that in a way which is as seamless as possible. So by returning that consent form, they're not actually agreeing to sell us their house. They're merely agreeing that we can talk to their insurance company to get information about their insurance details because that's part of how the offer is going to have to work. If they don't return that form quickly, it just means it's going to take us longer for us to be able to process, process their inquiry. I think we've got about 2,000. It's approaching that. I think that the really interesting thing is that those letters were sent out last uh, Friday. Um, you consider that uh, Monday and Tuesday were difficult days weather-wise. Um, uh, we had, uh, I think, um, in the, the first post after that, some 600 replies, a further 1,300 today. So um, a, a great, great response and uh, very encouraging. It does show that people are thinking about uh, moving, moving on and wanting to know what their options are. I think the other thing I was just going to mention, it's almost following up with the Minister was talking about the Wind Heat Programme, was there was quite a lot of talk when that program was announced about would the electricity system stand up to the fact that all those extra heat pumps going in. And from what I saw not being in Orion was the power system did actually stand up really well during those cold, cold days where I think this, the loading on the system in those, in those suburban areas where there's been a lot of damage would have been you know, far in excess of anything they've had this winter and so far and the lights didn't actually go out. So I think that should give everybody confidence 
that a lot of the repairs, the infrastructure are working really well. There's a hell of a lot still to be done. At the same time, you know, a, a day on, on Monday or Tuesday, if the power started falling over would have made life really difficult for a lot of people. So I think that was something we should celebrate. Roger, um, Jerry Minnis mentioned that you've written a letter um, to the Orange Side residents. Can you talk us through a bit more about what's in that letter? What um, the, letter, the letter sets out the time frame, we can talk about that. And we, we, we have you released a copy of that letter. So that, that, that letter sets out the time frames by which date we think we should be able to let them know. So it's our best estimate at the moment and we're doing our very best to keep to those time frames. You know, as, as you know, I've been very reluctant to release time frames because I think it creates pressures and uh, expectations that are difficult. Um, so these timelines, uh, we think, have sufficient leeway in them to make sure that the job is done properly because that's the most important thing. If you get a, a rush decision simply to meet somebody's headline, uh, that, that would be disgraceful and uh, serve the community very, very poorly. Uh, so we're going to make sure that the decisions are properly considered uh, because you're talking about people's lifetime equity here. Uh, but those, so those timelines are fairly long, uh, but they are, they are a reasonable indication. And as I said, we would hope that the, uh, uh, as we know more about what's necessary for gathering that information, we can move more quickly, but some areas, of course, are more difficult than others. So your orange zone, uh, for instance, Kaipo is at the end of August, so everyone else is, and they're your priority, so everyone else has got to be two, three, four, five months. Well, pr priority we're saying three to four weeks for, for um, Kaipo. And then the That's other right. oranges are obviously coming through after that. That's right, and the, the material that we'll give you today has those, those listed in them. Ooh, ooh. Can I make one other comment about the, the weather this week? I think the, um, the way in which the... Uh, city has been able to uh, have a big snow dump, a big thaw, and then see the, uh, the, uh, the, the stormwater system uh, handle that in such a splendid way is very, very encouraging. And it is a tribute to uh, Mark Christensen and all the guys at City Care and many other contractors who've helped to clean those systems out. It's, uh, it's very, very encouraging. In terms of the CBD, um, what we're seeing today, but I know the contractors were kept out for at least one day, what kind of setback um, have you had a chance to sort of look at the setback that the snow caused? Well, 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 Roger will answer. Well, I think, I think it's, had a, it's, had a, it's had a minor impact, but I, don't forget, a lot of these guys are working very long days in any case. And some of them may actually come up to hours. You know, in a week, they actually have to stop work because they've worked as many hours as they're actually allowed to work. So it'll have some impact, but I think it's a pretty minor impact, really. So it hasn't been a major delay in anything? No. Largely safety concerns because of the, the weight of that snow on buildings. And, and uh, on some unstable buildings. And you mentioned before, Jerry, that the, um, the the future investment, the reinvestment in Christchurch is starting to bring up again. Can you just elaborate on that? What you uh, yes, I've um, this week spent uh, one day in Australia talking to uh, reinsurance companies about uh, the, the long-term prospects here. Uh, and that they've got great interest in that, obviously, but also talking to investor groups. Uh, about some of the brownfields opportunities that exist here as well. So not only do we have our, our local people making such a splendid commitment, uh, we've now got outside interest and I think that um, is, is very, very significant. But there, there have been, I mean, there have been concerns expressed by commercial building owners and things in the past that, you know, they needed to be better looked after to get that reinvestment back in. Um, is those sort of comments that you discredited at the time, but are you now saying you're now focusing a bit more on that private equity stuff? Uh, with all due respect, what those building owners wanted was a massive government handout. Um, what I'm detecting is that there is no need for that because uh, there is significant interest in the redevelopment of Christchurch uh, by, from private capital.